Hello, everybody, and welcome. Delighted uh, to see you all for this fun session uh, about design. My name is Daniel Jackson, um, and I'm the organizer of this session. Uh, and I'm going to give incredibly brief introductions because I know you don't want to hear from me. Our first speaker is David Clark, who's a, a senior research scientist at CSAIL uh, and a pioneer of the internet who's been working on a lot of fundamental aspects of the design of the internet uh, since the 1970s. But his book is called The Design of an Internet. And, uh, and there's an important distinction there. And he'll, uh, he'll be telling you uh, about some of the very interesting thoughts he has um, about the role of design and uh, the implications of design in the context of the internet as a, as a large system. David. Thank you very much. Right. So let me just give a little bit of personal history here. I'm old. I started working on this around 1975 when uh, the internet was first being proposed. I developed software for one of the first computers. In the 1980s, I chaired what we today call the Internet Architecture Board. Back then, it was the Internet Activities Board. I've been involved since then in trying to understand what's shaping the future of the internet. As I say, the issues are not technical. And the reason I want to stress this is it's, it's, I want to remind people how little we knew what we were doing. And this is supposed to be a talk about design and design principles and so forth. And we were working out the most absolutely elemental basic issues back in the 1970s. And the design has proved to be resilient. But the internet still works. But we are coping with a variety of decisions that we made where if I could go back, I might make them a little different. Although. In fact, I'm somewhat proud of some of the decisions we made, given how thoroughly we didn't know what we were doing. So I want to talk about design. But if you're going to talk about design, the place you have to start is requirements. Until you have understood requirements, you, requirements, you can't talk about design. I like to point out that both hotels and jails have rooms with doors on them. But unless you know which one you're building, you might make some mistakes. Uh, the second thing is that one of the fundamental principles we teach in systems design is that, of course, systems are made out of parts. We call this modularity. And as soon as you talk about the modularity of a system, you then realize modules have interfaces. And as soon as you talk about interfaces, you are imposing constraints, because it is the specification of the things in the interface to which both sides have to agree. If, in fact, you can build a system and reduce the interaction through the interface, then both sides have more flexibility in how they inter operate their own parts. There's a, a sort of a systems thinker out of Cal Caltech named John Doyle who said, interfaces are the constraints that deconstrain. Because while you have to comply with the specification, if it's not in the specification of the interface, then you can do it any way you please. The, the core design element in a system like this is finding the right modularity and then assigning function to the modules. And there's a key issue here, which is to what extent do two modules interdepend on each other? Uh, if, if I'm willing to crash, if you crash, then it's very straightforward. OK, but uh, if we have mutual dependence and I don't want to crash when you crash, then I have to put a lot of effort into insulating myself from your mistakes. If we build a system in which I depend on you, but you don't depend on me, then we call that layering. Right? So applications depend on the operating system. In principle, the operating system does not depend on the correct operation of the application. If it's wrong, then you've built a very bad operating system. You don't want Windows to crash when one of your apps crashes. So uh, we, we have these ideas in the back of our head in general when we start building a system. And we, we have a general intuition about requirements. I mean, our field worships performance. right? I used to joke that the way you get the paper into SIGCOM is the graph goes up. And we, we like reusable parts. Jerry's going to talk a lot about how you design software packages with, with general desirable attributes. OK. I would point out something that was obvious to us only after about three years, which is when you modularize the system, you also modularize the design committees. And it's very useful to have clean modularity, because then the committees don't have to talk to each other all the time. But let's get down to networks, in particular, and internet. So what was the high-level requirement of the internet? Well, it's pretty obvious. OK. It's deliver packets. Well, sorry, deliver data, but we broke data into packets. OK, that's just a side comment. We don't have to talk about packets here. They're just little chunks of data with addresses on the front. And the fundamental requirement, of course, is that if you put the data in one side and it's got a well-formed address, the packet should show up on the other side. 
But in 1988, trying to boil this down, I wrote a slightly more specific comment was develop an effective technique. What did I mean by effective? Well, we could get back to that multiplexed utilization of existing interconnected networks. So one of the implications here, and this was a design goal for the ARPANET and the internet, was we wanted to use multiple kinds of networks underneath. The ARPANET was a network. It was built out of switches and, and long distance telephone circuits. But Ar ARPA also built a satellite net, they built a packet radio net, and we wanted to glue all these things together. So the goal of the internet was heterogeneous technology and what that meant, we absolutely had to minimize the assumptions we made about the capability of the technology that was underneath because the technology was highly unpredictable. And there, was, there used to be a, a conference called uh, uh, Interop and the guys who ran the show floor at Interop used to amuse themselves because they got so bored to see how, f how, many, how, how fast they could send bits down a piece of barbed wire. Well, of course, it just depends how long it is. If it's about 100 yards long, you can send it a gigabit. So barbed wire has a data capacity of a gigabit. It was that kind of flexibility we wanted in the internet. We wanted generality of function. We were building a network to hook computers together, and computers are general purpose devices. So we wanted a general purpose network. And this caused us to have an incredible intellectual collision with the telephone industry because the telephone people said, you guys are clowns, you don't know what you're doing, it'll never succeed, blah, 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 blah. And then they said, but by the way, we could design you a dandy network, but there's one thing we don't understand. What's it for? Well, whenever they designed networks, they knew exactly what it was for. It was for counting telephone calls. And I like to remind people they were so sure that the, it, that the telephone system was designed to carry telephone calls that when somebody invented modems, their first step was to try to have them declared illegal because they weren't phone calls. Okay, you know that 2600 hertz that you hear when you, how many people are old enough here to remember what a modem used to sound like, sorry, okay. You know that first 2600 hertz, you know what that does? That turns off the voice specific data compression in the system so it can carry modem signals. Okay, but we were trying to build a network and we didn't know what it was for. And they thought that meant we were out of our minds. We said, well, we designed general purpose computers without knowing what they're for. And they said, yeah, we sort of get that. But with networking, we can't get it. And of course, evolvability. We wanted to build a system that was future proof. I like to remind people the ARPANET, the backbone circuits were 50 kilobits a second. I didn't say mega. OK. So cover modularity is your friend. It bounds what you have to change if something has to change. OK. And functional modularity. Is, is a critical issue in this space. So here's a very simple cartoon of an internet, okay? There are computers around the outside and there are routers inside. Here's the core question. What functionality goes in the router, which is the thing, that, these black lines are not wires, they're networks, okay? They could be an ARPANET or an ethernet or a packet radio net, okay? They hook the routers together. What functionality goes in the computers at the edge and what functionality goes in the routers? And the other thing about this picture, of course, is that connection there it's not an abstract interface between software modules. That's a physical connection, OK? Those are separate physical boxes. The modularity here at one level is physical, but now what we have to do is assign function to the different physical modules, OK? So here's the first order requirement, as I just stated it, OK? Networks deliver data. It's availability. We broke the data into packets. A packet is just a chunk of data with an address on the front. And here is the core statement of the internet. If you give the internet a packet with a valid address on the front, it will deliver the packet to the endpoint associated with that destination. Duh, okay, what you expect it to do, okay. But with what reliability? The first thing we figured out is networks are not always reliable, get over it. They will lose packets for lots and lots of reasons. I don't know whether I have the time to tell my story of the first time IBM tried, no I don't, I don't have time when IBM tried to design a network under the assumption that the switches were reliable. Completely disastrous outcome. The second thing we learned is that different applications have different service requirements. You might say different semantic requirements. There are some applications that don't care about reliability. If you're doing a file transfer, you'd like all the bits to show up in order. But if you're doing real-time speech, like Zoom or something like that, and you're missing a packet, just, just go on, okay. Just, just compress the thing out or go and, and keep going. I mean, humans have a very high level error correction. We say, what did you say? So don't worry about it. just, just go, 
Okay, because otherwise you spend all this time, what was that packet, what was that packet, what? and it screws up the latency of the conversation. And since our design goal was generality, we realized that we had to be very careful where we put the function that enforced the semantic capability of the system. So here's an obvious statement, routers route. The routing algorithm is in the routers, of course, that's where it goes. But the knowledge of what the service semantics are has to be in the computers at the edge, not in the routers. That was the first modularity decision we made, and it took us five years to get there. So, functional isolation. Minimize the number of things you have to change to add new functionalities. Routers must not know about applications. That's critical. Because if routers did know about applications, then to deploy a new application, you'd have to change all the routers. And we realized in the 1990s that that had a secondary implication, which is the internet service providers could control what applications you ran. And we said, oh yeah, the telephone company controlled what application you could run on the, internet, on the telephone system, and there was only one, it was called voice, okay. But hosts equally must not know about routing, because if you want to change the routing protocol and the hosts know about the routing, then you have to change all the hosts. No, don't try to do that. In 1984, three of us wrote a paper called the End-to-End -end Arguments, and the general point of the paper was applications define the required service semantics. Routers should not try to provide application-specific service enhancements. To the extent possible, you should push function to the edges, out to the computers, and you're making the network as simple as possible. I assume everybody recognizes that quote at the bottom of the slide. Who said that? Are you awake? Albert Einstein. Yeah. Okay. So, back to requirements. In 1988, 1880, 1988, I wrote a paper where I tried to get a little deeper into the requirements. The internet communication must continue despite loss of networks. Things go bump in the net, as somebody once said. The internet must support multiple types of communication service. That's not very clearly put, but what I meant was some people need reliability. They need all the packets in order. Some things like real-time speech. I would stress we did real-time speech in the 70s, and we did telecon video teleconferencing in the 80s. Okay? We were just waiting for the capacity of the network to catch up. There's nothing novel about those applications. The internet architecture must accommodate a variety of networks. Yes. The architecture must permit distributed management of its resources. Yes. Cost effective, yes, host attachment with low level of effort, and accountable. This is, motherhood, this is not a motherhood list, they're in order. The ones at the bottom, we never did accounting. Okay, we just never did that, we just never got there. Uh, I would say that we, point six, we sort of got there, point five, cost effective, I'm not even sure what it meant. It was more important that the system be reliable and robust in the place of favors than it absolutely optimized the cost. So now. Fast forward to the mid-1990s, the internet becomes very commercial and I have some belated uh, insights. Uh, modularity, especially physical modularity, the sort that I'm talking about here, induces industry structure. And I said, well, ooh. And all my economist friends said, you didn't know that? I said, I'm sorry, I'm late to the party. Go read Ronald Coase on the theory of the firm. Okay, why do firms exist? And, and I had this great realization, of course, because allocation of function to modules allocates power to the actors. I don't mean power in the electrical sense, I mean power in a sociological or political science sense. And so what we were doing with modularity was allocating power to the actors in the ecosystem. And I said, oh, okay. Furthermore, allocation of function allocates the option for economic returns. In an ecosystem which is being built by the private sector, every element must be able to make money. If one of the modulars, because of the modularity, you've created something where one of the players can't make money, then the thing doesn't get off the ground. So allocating knowledge of applications to the end nodes, we put a money insulator between the application designers and the ISPs. There are these ISPs down there digging ditches and putting fiber in the ground and carrying poles and pulling bits around. And then there's Windows and then there's Google up there doing all kinds of stuff that generates value and it's not trickling down to the ISPs, and that has created a tension which we are still dealing with today. So, uh, back here I said what function goes where, what function goes here, okay. What we learned was now we are defining the structure, the, the industry structure. So, here was my economics lesson. One economist in me, he said, the internet's about routing money, routing packets is a side effect, and you screwed up the money, he didn't say screwed, but I'm trying to be polite here. You, you screwed up the money routing protocols, and I said, I didn't design any money routing protocols, and he said, that's what I said. Um, 
And by the way, if you go to the IETF, where Internet Engineering Task Force, they are absolutely determined never to design a money routing protocol because if they do, they will immediately get thrown into the middle of the power struggles over revenue capture. Okay, so nobody's out there designing money routing protocols. But we had an interesting fight a while back when Netflix decided they wanted to put their own caches, all content caches, all around the internet. And Comcast was sent forth as champion for the ISPs to do battle with Netflix. And Netflix was sent forth as the champion for all the content providers. And they did battle. And Netflix said, we bring all the value. It's only because of our value that your customers want to attach to the network. So you should let us attach for free. And we will put lots and lots and lots and lots of caches all over the internet so you don't use up much of your capacity to deliver the traffic. We'll put caches everywhere. That means our cost is going up and up and up. And so your costs are going down and down and down. So you should allow us to attach for free. And Comcast says, no, you're not a peer of ours. You're a commercial provider. We reserve the right to charge you money. And they did battle. They actually went to the chairman of the FCC and each sat in his office and they bitched. And the chairman, who was a very wise man, this is Wheeler, said, told me this story later, he said, wait a minute, are you here because you want me to regulate internet pricing? I said, oh shit, no, and they ran away. But, uh, okay. But eventually Comcast won and Netflix blinked and so they pay them, okay. But not much, but it's a pittance, but it made the point. I was, I was sitting in a cafe, I won't tell you what the ISP was, but I was sitting in this Italian cafe uh, with the, the executive of this ISP and we were drinking wine and so forth. And he was explaining to me how he thought that there were some complicated intellectual arguments that meant when he carried Google's traffic, he should, be, he should be paid a fee for that. And I didn't particularly think I believed his intellectual arguments. I finally said, wait a minute, can we just boil this down? And he looked at me and said, yes. I said, Google has a lot of money, you want some? He said, yes. <laughs> okay. So here's a case study. I want to talk about the domain name system. I want to talk about allocation of power. I think most people know what the domain name system does, right? It translates a name like www.mit.edu into an address that goes in the header of the packet, okay? That's where the addresses come from, okay? If you're a computer, you send a message with the domain name to a machine called a recursive resolver, and it says, okay, I'll figure it out for you. And the first thing it says is, okay, what's an edu? So it goes to something called the root, and it says, tell me where a machine is that knows about edu. And then it sends a message to the machine that knows about edu and says, tell me what you know about MIT. And it gives you back the IP address of a machine that knows about MIT. And it sends a packet to the machine that says, what do you know about MIT? Where does it keep its www? And you come back with an IP address. And then the computer attaches to it, OK? Who controls these boxes? Well, typically, the recursive resolver is provided to you by your ISP if you use Comcast. Comcast provides your recursive resolver. If you use MIT Network, MIT provides your recursive resolver. But if you don't like that recursive resolver, you can use a different one. How many people know the IP address of Google's recursive resolver? One, two, three, four, five, six. Some rooms, everybody raises their hand. It's 8.8.8.8. And if you can't remember that, it's 4.4.4.4. Um, but you can use the one from Google if you want, OK? Why do ISPs provide a recursive resolver? Well, one answer is yeah, we just have to have them for the internet to work, and they're good citizens, and that's fine. But the next is, so they can observe what names you look up. This is how they profile you, OK? This is how they decide to show you ads when you type in a, a, a URL that doesn't exist. Also, this is so they argue they can protect you. They say, if you look up a name that is known to be associated with a phishing site, we won't turn it into an address for you. We're protecting you, OK? So Google's recursive resolver is a threat to their power and to their revenue, OK? So Google came up with this idea. They said, we're going to replace the very simple protocol. Uh, maybe we won't go back. Um, uh, we're going to replace that very simple protocol where the host talks to a recursive resolver, which was simply a one packet going this way and another packet going that way. World's simplest protocol, nothing encrypted. Of course, we were prohibited by the federal government from using encryption on the internet until the year 2000. So that's just an interesting fact to remember, because they wanted to make it easy to spy on. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. They said that. NSA said that to me. We, what broke it, by the way, was e-commerce. Economics always trumps security. OK, talk about priority of requirements. OK. Uh, e-commerce, oh god, I guess we have to let them encrypt things. OK. But, uh, Google said, let's encrypt the connections, and furthermore, let's make them just look like ordinary web queries. 
HTTP. So we're going to do DNS over HTTP. They said better privacy, and also it makes it harder to censor things because they just look like they just look like web queries. And so how can you tell what's a DNS lookup? The ISPs lost it because they assumed that what Google was going to do in their own browser, which dominates the market, Chrome, was that when you ran DOH, they would send the query to 8.8.8.8. Okay. So Google was going to steal all your DNS lookups, and the ISP wouldn't get to see them anymore. And they lost it. And a few of us said, by the way, Google, would you like to clarify what you had in mind? And they said, when you look up something, we'll try using DOH, but we'll use it to, the, to your recursive resolver. And all of a sudden, ISPs were instantly happy, because now they could still see it, but nobody else could see it, because now it was encrypted. So I said, whoo -hoo. OK, so it's all about power and the allocation of power, the allocation of control, the allocation of the potential for economic return. That's what's driving the modularity of this system. Now, there were some guys. We, we ran a project about 15 years ago called uh, Future Internet Architecture. NSF did this. And they basically invited the research community to say, well, envision what an internet of 30 years from now might look like. Okay, And clean slate. Don't, don't think about IP. Don't think about it. Just, just imagine something. And there was one team there that said, you know, the way we're using the DNS today is very, very, very complicated. It's a big mess. Those boxes that look up edu and MIT and WWD, they're actually doing very complicated things these days. When you look up facebook.com, the recursive resolver for Facebook may give you back a different IP address depending on where in the internet you are. So they're using it for traffic management and efficient routing and so forth. And to some of these designers, they said, that's a kludge. That's stupid. The network knows about topology and latency. So why don't we just put the IP, instead of putting the IP address in the packet, why don't we put the DNS name? Now, this is an interesting architectural alternative, OK? Um, it does create a rather interesting routing problem because IP addresses are topologically structured, so like area codes, you know. but of course, now we have portable numbers, so it's flat address based. It's all screwed up anyway. But, but imagine trying to route on uh, to you know a few billion machines on the internet where they have addresses that have nothing to do with topology. Okay, it's an interesting routing problem. But their assumption was that ISPs have the best understanding of the topology and the capacity and what's currently working. Now, this is not a new idea. Uh, there have been some old schemes. I don't know that anybody here wants to go back and look at them, but there were proposals recently for a system was a system called Triad, a system called Dona. And the one that was done as part of the, uh, the name data network was, was part of the Future Internet Architecture Project. And it raised some interesting questions about routing. But here's the question. OK. And you can just think about it for a minute. Who liked this idea and who hated this idea, this functional alloc, this placement of function? OK. Who liked it? Yeah. He said the ISPs. Um, yes. Although they didn't like it enough to like it. I'll explain what I mean by that. The people that really liked it were the Chinese. Because it made censorship trivial, because the piece of the data you're trying to get was right in the packet. <laughs> if you don't want the data, just drop the packet. Okay. The content providers hated it because they wanted the power to control the name to address binding. They didn't want to take it away from them. What the ISPs said is it's incredibly complicated to implement because we don't know how to write on, route on flat names. And it's not worth the operate the power we would get is not worth the operational complexity of doing it. It's not the best trade-off for us. And of course, there were firms out there that were selling very sophisticated name to address binding. They would implement a very sophisticated authoritative name server for you, companies like Akamai, and they didn't like it. Okay. So we'll see where this idea goes. Um, but here's some other considerations. Okay. We didn't know how to talk about a manageable system. We, the phone company people, when they were not busy telling us it would never work, kept telling us the hard problem is management. Moving the data is trivial. Forget about it. Just move, the data will be, just figure out how to manage the system. How do you deal with things that break and fail and configuration? And uh, of course, we made the problem really hard because since the internet doesn't know what you're trying to do, it can't tell when you're having a bad day. You know, you're trying to use Zoom and you're pounding and there's nothing. Like, ah, but ISP has no reason to think. It has no idea what the problem is because they don't know what you're trying to do. 
I forwarded every package you sent in the left tower. You didn't send any, but you know, I forwarded every package you sent. But we left out features and interfaces that would have made it easy to manage, and that is something I would do very differently again. Um, we didn't know how to think about security in the beginning. People say, oh, you're a bunch of academics, and we didn't think about security. We thought really hard about security. That's why I was having all these conversations with NSA about the fact they really didn't want us encrypting anything. But we designed systems without really understanding who the threat actor was. So for example, we have a global routing protocol in the internet called the Border Gateway Protocol. And there was a vulnerability in it. It was identified in 1982, and we're still trying to fix it because of the coordination problems of getting everybody to agree on what the requirement really is and the best solution and the functional placement and all these kind of things. Uh, it sometimes helps to have somebody in charge. Okay. Uh, how do you future-proof a system? We realized, in 19, we realized in 1975 that the IP addresses, which are 32 bits, were not long enough. But we were told we had to make them that length because otherwise you could not, if they were longer than that, you couldn't build a router that would go fast enough. You can't imagine how primitive computers were back then. Of course, I have to remind you there were 50 kilobit circuits that we were worried about. My God, somebody came in with a T1. Oh, that's one and a half megabits. Oh, I can't believe how fast that is. That was exciting. Um, 1981, we, we said we need a new address space. We called IPv6. We're still trying to get it deployed, okay? The idea we had in 1991. I said, never let the host be part of the routing system. We did one thing that's really clever. We put a hop count in a packet. We didn't quite know why, but we knew there was a requirement. And that is that if there's a routing inconsistency in the internet, a transient routing inconsistency, packets should not circulate forever. If I think the best route to some place is you and you think the best route is to me, the packet's going to go little, 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 little. And if they start doing that, then the whole network will just fill up with crap packets. So we said, we don't know how the routing system's going to work, but we're going to put a kill switch in every packet. If it loops more than a certain number of times, we're just going to drop it. Okay. And it cleans out all the, in, the transient inconsistencies. It was a very clever design decision. I'm very proud of it, given that we didn't know how we were going to do routing back then. So when we talked about, yep, three minutes. I, my clock says three minutes. Um, when we started the future internet architecture, you could sort out the various schemes by what their highest priority requirement was. I'll just put down the list here. Uh, how do you deal with highly mobile endpoints that are constantly changing their address? That's a hard, interesting problem. We didn't think about it in, in the 70s. How do you prevent denial of service attacks where you round up a few hundred thousand bots and then all flood a machine? Okay. Maybe you should require permission from a receiver before you can send it packets. That's an interesting idea. That's not the way the internet works. Implement different routes for traffic based on service quality. Support new services in the network, not just routing, but maybe data transformations or something like that. Uh, how do you build an interplanetary internet? Uh, how do you build a network where the latencies may be measured in days? Okay, Entirely different design problem, and there's a solution called Delay Tolerant Network, DTN, works on that. Maybe we should have put some knowledge of identity in. Uh, we didn't, deliberately. I think that was the right decision. People keep telling us, why don't packets have license plates? And I keep saying they don't want them. Um, so here's a summary statement. In a physically distributed system, decisions about functional modularity allocate responsibility, they allocate power, they allocate economic benefit to different actors, and design is about allocation of power. That's not something we teach our students. Our field is driven to improve performance. You know, the curve goes up, I get my paper in. Performance is a small part of the small space of requirements. And finally, I'll say, when you see a fight over functional mechanisms, it's often a hidden fight over the priorities of requirements, but people don't say that. They say, I want to put mumble mumble into the network. I say, why do you want to put mumble mumble into the network? I say, I want to put, yeah. What? And if you can, it's not that they're trying to, uh, they have alternative ways of achieving the same goal. They haven't discovered that the two of them are trying to discover, d d achieve different goals. Okay, I'm done.